Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bible Study Live. It is 6.30. Actually, it's 6.31. I'm a minute late jumping on here today, but uh, I'm so glad that uh, it's time to, to study the God's Word with you. I'm excited tonight to get to study God's Word with you. So I hope that uh, you're excited, uh, as excited as I am, to study this. We're continuing our study on the book of Revelation, and... Uh, from a different perspective, albeit. Uh, and I think I'm hearing a lot of feedback from a lot of you that this study is really opening your eyes to perhaps understand some of the deeper meanings of Revelation in a whole new way. So maybe you're learning what I'm learning, and that is that I really see the book of Revelation as the second most important book of the Bible after the Gospels. This book will teach us how to live as dissident disciples in difficult times. So, hey, I, again, I'm Brad Riley. If you're new to us tonight, Bible Study Live, we're always here on Wednesdays at 6.30, and we do some in-depth analysis of the scriptures, usually book by book, but uh, I'm just, we've got a lot of new people joining, and I'm really glad for that. So, uh, hey, if you're coming along tonight, why don't you say hello? Uh, let me pop open my window here so I can uh, follow your comments, and that's last week's. Got the wrong week up. I got to get with tonight here, but uh, as I reload the page, it'll come up. And there it is. So if you're new tonight, we got Al. Al is here. Good evening, Al. Michael, good evening. Glad you guys are joining in tonight, and all of you, as you join in, say hello. I really love to be able to create a conversation about God's Word. As we, uh, as we talk together tonight, you can ask questions. You can make comments in the comment box. Uh, no, question is, uh, no question is too uh, dumb or too unthoughtful. I mean, just ask. You will never know if you don't ask. So I love it when you ask questions, and I'm not the Bible answer man, but I've studied God's Word a long time, and I love God's Word, and I can't wait to talk with you about it. So think of this as just a, a, a sit down with Brad and a cup of coffee and talking about God's Word. Tonight, it is cold in my office. Man, I'm, I'm ready for springtime down here. My office at home is, is really cold in the basement. So I've got this fresh, warm cup of coffee right here. And tonight's Bible study is brought to you by my happy, happy, happy mug from Phil Robertson. So it's... Uh, it's Louisiana coffee, so might as well have a Louisiana celebrity on my mug. Mm -mm -mm. Dark roast. Nothing beats dark roast. Good stuff. Sue's jumping in tonight. Hi, Sue. Susan Slatter, good to have you too. And Susan, Kevin and Susan are here. Thank you for joining in. Um, we're going to be looking, we're transitioning tonight to Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And I'm calling this chapter, uh, part one of chapter four and five. We're combining those two chapters. Uh, they, they recognize a decided shift in the telling of the story. But they have a great purpose, and they're strategically right where they are. So we're going to look at that purpose and how it relates to the book as a whole. Um, but if you have your Bible study live uh, bookmarks, Grab Brad Riley Ministries bookmarks. Grab that out. It's got the prayer before the study of Scripture. And if you don't have one, um, you should. I'll get it up to you. Ask me about it. I, I took some to my office at the church on uh, this week, so I do have some in my office at the church that I can give to those of you who are coming from the, the Goddard Church. Uh, my, my new assignment, which I'm loving, uh, two weeks now under my belt as pastor at the Goddard Church, and just uh, loving it, and uh, just just can't say enough good about what God is doing out in Goddard. So I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And I'm glad that many of you are part of this Bible study, too. Uh, so thank you for joining in. Linda, I'm so glad you're with us tonight. Good evening. Um, you know, I see a couple of hearts and likes and things. Thank you for that, because part of what makes social media teaching or uh, churches successful is being able to share it. If you share it, if you share something you like, like these Bible studies, 
it's going out there to all the people that you know that I don't know. And so that's a powerful thing for, uh, for us to share the gospel amongst people. The gospel is best shared amongst friends. So when you share this Bible study with people, I want you to know what you're sharing with them. You're sharing with them a safe place to hear the truth of God's word. No condemnation, no judgment. Everyone is welcome, but they're going to get the truth of God's word. They're not just going to get my opinion. When I give my opinion, and I have opinions, <laughs> just ask, uh, I have opinions, I will let you know it's my opinion, not the fact of the truth of the word. But uh, generally speaking, I'm just going to give you the truth of God's word as, as I can see it. Sandra Schubert is back this week. Thank you, Sandra. I'm glad you're feeling better. I know you had told me you weren't going to make it last week, and I'm so glad you're back this week. But uh, what a great week it's been. So do you have your Bibles? Do you have them open to Revelation chapter 4? Uh, do you have your coffee? Who else has got a great cup of coffee? Can anybody share with me? Good evening, Don and Pat. Thanks for being in here. Share with me your favorite. This is just our discussion started tonight. Share with me your favorite coffee brew or blend or brand whatever it is sue waters thank you for being in here tonight thank you um i'm hoping dave's there with you if he is say hello hi dave uh, does anybody have a favorite coffee what's your favorite i have so many it's hard for me to pick but mm. tonight i'm drinking a new orleans blend dark roast from the Community Coffee Company out of Louisiana. And it's a really great dark roast. It really is. Uh, but I have so many favorites uh, anymore. It's just, just hard for me to choose. Uh, Kevin, and so Susan said, Kevin, a black rifle coffee. Yes, black rifle coffee is good. And I love the company too. I love their company stand that they take uh, that's very pro uh, pro United States, and I love that. Um, Linda is not a coffee drinker. Can I stay? You know, Linda, because you're so nice, we're going to let you stay. No, you can drink whatever you want. You can do hot tea. Sometimes every now and then I come in here with a hot cup of tea. But tonight, usually it's coffee. But hey, iced tea, soda, whatever is your favorite drink, just drop in with it. Here's why I say that, because this is fellowship together. We're not only students and teachers and, and learning together. This is, this is fellowship. And so we're not sharing food. At least I shouldn't be eating in here because then I couldn't talk. But we can share a nice cup of something to drink. I'm seeing Nespresso machine, Susan Slutter. I love Nespresso machines. I don't have one. But I have had one at a friend's, and it is delicious. Lattes. Wow. Good stuff. My wife, Rhonda, iced mochas with toffee, crunch, and oat or almond milk. She has a precise drink that she likes there. Um, Mike Connor, my favorite of late has been the Scooter's Dark Roast, and I'm with you. I love Scooter's Dark Roast. Good stuff. Cheryl Freeman said, I love the mocha flavor. If I'm going to get flavored coffee, mocha is one of my favorite things to do. If I'm going to go get a latte somewhere, I really like the mocha flavors too, Cheryl. That's chocolate and coffee. What? What could go wrong with chocolate and coffee? Well, hey, we've got a great group tonight. Let's begin with the uh, let's begin with the prayer before the study of Scripture. For those of you that are new, I discovered this prayer oh a number of years ago. I didn't really know where it came from, but I loved it so much. I decided to tweak it just a little bit because I, I wanted to maybe update the wording just a little bit and. Uh, and then, lo and behold, I found out it was actually written in the 4th century, attributed to St. John Chrysostom, who was a patriarch of Constantinople, and one of the greatest preachers in the history of the Christian faith. Uh, his name, Chrysostom, means the golden-tongued one. Um, so, this was his prayer, and I have not been able to improve on it. It really says what my heart wants to say as we open God's Word and study together. So, I invite you to take out that prayer, that prayer card. And again, if you don't have one, see me and I'll be sure you get it. Um, 
I sent them out in my year-end giving statements for people that donate to Brad Riley Ministries. I try and give you uh, books and bookmarks and different things along the way. Uh, so a lot of folks got them by the end of the year. We just got these made towards the end of the year. Um, but uh, if, you ha- if you don't have it, see me. I want to get one in your hand. Let's pray as we begin. Illumine our hearts, O Master, lover of all humanity, with the pure light of your divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may understand your gospel teachings. Implant deep within us the fear of your blessed commandments, that through them we may conquer all carnal desires and may be transformed to live both thinking and doing the things that are pleasing to you. For you, O Lord, are the light of our souls and bodies, and unto you we give all glory and praise together with our Father, who is from everlasting, and the all-holy, good, and life-creating Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. And amen. Thank you for praying that with me. I know know that you were praying along. And uh, let's look at Revelation chapter 4. I'll be reading tonight from the New American Standard Bible, but feel free to follow along in whatever Bible you have with you. Chapter 4. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne proceed flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne. And they will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy art thou, O Lord, and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou didst create all things, and because of thy will they existed and were created. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That is chapter 4. I'll hold on chapter 5. These two are connected, uh, and remember, when the Bible was written, it wasn't written in verses and chapters. Those were put together a long time later. But chapter 5 and 4 are really an extension of each other, but there's more than we can talk about in this one setting. So we're just going to do 4 tonight and 5 next week. Um, And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, there's a whole lot of symbolism here, a whole lot of imagery, and we're going to talk about what some of that means or might mean. Uh, One of the things that that I first want to talk with you about is what a gift this is. Chapter 4 and 5 give us an incredible gift. It's a window into the majesty of eternal worship that is ongoing in heaven right now. 
Now remember, we cannot take this wooden literally because it ex it's otherworldly. This is just a revelation to a human named John so that he could describe it in ways that we could try and comprehend. So the idea of beautiful stones and crystal seas and, and uh, white, white robes and crowns of gold, these are all things that m have deep meaning to the people that, are that were hearing this, reading it back in the first century. They also have great deep meaning to us as well. And our job here tonight, as it is in this study, is not to predict the future. It's not to show you how, oh, certain things are actually the fulfillment of what's going on in Israel or any kind of predictiveness. If you're new to this study and you haven't caught up yet with all of the previous nine sessions, you'll understand that, that I believe the book of the Revelation was written as a word to the people to teach them how to worship and what it means to worship, to be prepared to live in very difficult, tough times. So therefore, as our friend Scott McKnight, who wrote the book Revelation for the Rest of Us, which I've used as a companion to this study, this isn't a study of his book, that's just a companion to this study. Many of you are reading it, and I'm glad for that. Uh, as he says, we're called to be followers of Jesus who live as dissident disciples dissident disciples. That means one who is willing to stand on truth no matter what happens around us. That's the dissident part of it. It's not easy. And in my lifetime, I'm seeing it get increasingly harder in the freedom we enjoy in America even to live this incredible spirit-filled Christian life that we're all called to live. But around the world, there are those that have lived in incredible, uh, even in this modern era, incredible um, torture and horrible uh, violence and uh, tribulation. And this has been true throughout the ages. So you see, the book of Revelation has a word for everyone in every age. But we're remembering that John said in chapter 1, these things which must soon take place. And even here tonight in chapter 4, he calls their attention to the fact that these are things which are about to take place after those, you know. Uh, he says in verse 1, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Well, what are the these things that he's talking about? John, the read for the rest of the book, John, John has gotten this revelation on the island of Patmos, and, but there's been this transition in his revelation. In chapter 4 on, he's been called up into heaven. Now, I know there are many prophetic teachers who see that as the rapture of the church, called up into heaven. I don't believe that, and that's my opinion. I'm telling you that's my opinion. I don't believe that, but be a pretty long discussion as to why I don't believe that. Because I don't believe that's what that's written for. That's written, what we're, what we're getting here is to see that John has been given the, the incredible blessing and privilege of seeing worship in heaven. Worship in heaven. Can you imagine that? Worship in heaven? Wow. And before we get through a chapter five, you're gonna you're gonna have a whole new you're gonna have a whole new frame of reference to what is real worship. Worship is a many faceted jewel. It really is, um, and there's parts of it that you just don't get living in our culture today. You just don't get without getting into this book and getting into these chapters and really seeing what's going on. So, again, all the way through here, if you have a question or a comment, jump right in. Please stop me. I'm following the dialogue in the comment box. And if you're a member of Bible Study Live, then you know you got your Week 10 notes uh, yesterday. They came out yesterday. 
And so I'll keep them here in front of me. For those of you who are wondering what that is, uh, you know, as a way of helping support this ministry and kind of help me get uh, books going that I'm trying to get written, uh, it's $50 a year to join Brad Riley Ministries Bible Study Live. The Bible study is free on Facebook Live, but for those that, that jump in and support me that way, I like to give you a little extra insight there. So there are some uh, things that I mail out each week as notes that help you prepare for the study. Things that are just, they're just talking points that I have created for myself. Uh, and sometimes I get uh, busy and go off on a rabbit hole and I forget some of the time. So the notes really help keep me grounded. But here's what I want to begin with tonight. I want to begin with this incredible privilege to see God. This incredible privilege to see God. Now, of course, the Bible tells us no one has ever seen God, okay? We understand that. John saw Jesus Christ, who is God. But I mean, God, Father God, is spirit, and no one has ever seen him. And so notice that when, when John is in heaven, uh, and he is uh, he sees Behold, this great throne, uh, and he describes the throne in this whole setting as being a place. Uh, he, in verse 3, he says, he who was seated on the throne. That's God. That's God, our Father, okay? He, he's describing him like the appearance of these brilliant stones. This is, this is the most uh, luxurious, ornate beauty that, John's mind is comprehending as this revelation is given to him. Doesn't mean that God is made out of jewels. Okay, he's the spirit. But it's, it's, it's showing the magnificence and the splendor of who our God is and the splendor of his worship. So around that throne, it says, there are... Uh, 24 thrones, 24 smaller thrones. Fascinating, isn't it? 24 smaller thrones. And seated on those thrones are 24, and the word here that's used are elders. Okay, the word here is the, the Greek word presbyteros. Presbyteros. I'm not really good at spelling it, but P R E S B U T E R O S, I think. Presbyteros. We get the English word presbytery, okay? The Presbyterian church, okay? This is the Greek word for elder. And throughout the New Testament, this is the word that it, it connotates the ordained, if you will, the elder. I am an ordained elder, okay? So uh, it, it connotates everyone's a minister, but it's just an office that is, and everyone's equal, okay? But it's an office for those that have been called and set apart for pastoral priestly service. So different churches have different words for that, but elder is the most common English word. And so that's why in most English Bibles you're going to read the word elder there. But Greek, it's presbyteros. Now, in that he says there are 24 elders, immediately our minds are drawn to the numbers. You know, what do the numbers mean? That's what sometimes gets a lot of Bible prophecy teachers in trouble because they're playing a game of numerology with, with letters. Some of these are really easy to figure out. But when you start talking about, you know, whether it's uh, 1,200 days and three and a half years, and that's half of seven years and things, and we start making prediction of, predictions about the future, that, that's where we run into trouble. But these 24 elders, I think, are fairly obvious who they are. Um, as you get into uh, later into the book, you're going to notice that there are way more than just 24 people around this throne. There's going to be myriads, too many to count. But these 24, they're dressed in white, and they have gold crowns. So what do we know about Scripture in the New Testament that promises us about uh, the saints in heaven, those who win the race, if you will, as Paul says. Uh, there is laid up for me, Paul says, a crown of glory. Heavenly rewards. This is imagery that speaks to the fact that there are, these are the people that have won the race. Now, why 24? 
Well, 24 is a very uh, appropriate number because it, it brings together both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Twelve tribes of Israel, that's representative of the whole of God's chosen people in the Old Covenant. And twelve apostles, which is representative of the New Covenant. And how that was opened to everyone in the world, not just the Jewish people. So, 24 is naturally, I believe, and most scholars will tell you they agree. These, these are the elders. These are the, these are the, these are the, uh, the heads of the tribes of Israel. These are the, you know, this, uh, whether it's actually uh, the 12 sons of Jacob, very probably is. Definitely, probably the 12 apostles. But John isn't given that information, so we shouldn't ascribe that literal meaning. But they represent the entire people of God throughout history and throughout the world. And they obviously are reigning. A throne is a place where a person reigns. A king reigns. They have a crown. Kings have crowns. Uh, and again, this is not meant to be male or female. Uh, we know that males and females will reign in heaven equally together. They were created equal by God, and they'll reign equal in eternity by God. Many scriptures were written in a masculine-dominated way because that was the culture of the time. Um, so, as we look at that, coffee break time. Mm. So good, makes me happy, happy, happy. Someday... I'm a collector of mugs, if you haven't noticed. I just love, every week I have a different mug. Try and rotate them through. I only have so much room in the cabinets, but just like unique things. Or maybe if I've traveled somewhere or done something, I, I like uh, like unique mugs. But the Phil Robertson mug was a gift to me from Brooke one year, and I uh, just kind of love that. Happy, happy, happy. Um, so, back to the scripture here. Here's what's fascinating. Alongside those elders... There are four living creatures. Now, I'm going to ask here if somebody wants to jump in. What are you hearing? There's another part of Scripture that has imagery like this, similar to this. What we read about these, these, uh, the throne of God and the four living creatures. There's another part of Scripture. Does anybody recognize what it is? Let's just throw that out as a little extra credit test question. Put it in the comment box if you know. It's Old Testament. There's actually two books of the Old Testament that have imagery like this. Daniel is a great guess, but not, not the ones that are specific about this imagery. Good, 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 good guess. Good guess. What is it? Who else wants to jump in there? Great guess, though. Daniel has a lot of imagery that is related to the book of Revelation. But this one is, might be one that you don't remember. The book of Ezekiel and Isaiah. Yes, Susan just got it, Isaiah. The book of Ezekiel and the book of Isaiah both speak of visions of heaven and they both speak specifically about creatures that are many-faced and many winged. They don't, they don't correspond directly. The ones in, in the Old Testament are not exactly like these four, but there's m major similarities. And what we can understand by that is that these are some, these are, these are some form of cherubim, if you will, because it seems that their role is to worship God in heaven. And the cherubim, that's what they do. They worship God in heaven. There are different uh, types of angels, that's a huge study uh, someday that I've never actually attempted to teach. <clears throat> but cherubim, seraphim, these are ones that you hear of quite a bit. Um, and so here, let's look at these creatures here. It says that, um, number one, they're, they're around the throne. They have eyes in front and behind, and it says all around. So they're really weird looking, uh, definitely. It says that they have four different features. One has a face that looks like a lion. One looks like a calf, or your Bible might say an ox. 
And the other is like that of a human or a man. And the last one like that of an eagle who is flying. So these four images, again, here's imagery. What does it mean? We're always tempted to ask the question, what does it mean? And, and we should ask the question. We just don't want to speculate too deeply. But I think there are things we can draw from this. Um, and that is, first of all, look at the four creatures. Verse 8, they have, each one of them has six wings. And I, I think in Ezekiel they had four. Um, and it says the eyes are all around. And it says day and night they do not cease singing. Holy, holy, holy. This we see in the Old Testament as well. They're singing to God. Now it says that when they're singing to God, this worship song, Holy, 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 it's the song of heaven. It says that the 24 elders fall down in worship, take their crowns, and cast them before God in his throne. The glassy sea, if you will. So this is an act. John is showing us, uh, he's been shown, and so he's, re he's putting into the words that he can, this worship, eternal worship. And this is eternal. It just keeps going. It's been going since before the elders ever got there, okay, the four creatures. But the elders, we know, come out of the time of, uh, of humanity uh, as they enter heaven. And this is an eternal act that is going to continue on, well, as the old prayer said that I read, unto ages of ages. That means forever and ever. Um, and, and he says that. They say that in their prayer. Uh, who was, who is, and who is to come. Uh, and it just, there's, a, there's an incredible uh, act of worship here that I don't want us to miss. There are a lot of worship songs in them being sung in churches today that have been written based on this. Um, and I won't sing them for you here, but uh, you know what they are. Holy, holy, holy. In many different, it's a great hymn. Holy, holy, holy. That kind of is the, the standard, if you will, that great hymn. There's many worship songs that have been born out of this. Uh, this people, writers of music have seen this and been inspired now, I want to digress just a little bit to talk about these four creatures. And, and I, want to, I want to ask you, why do you think there's the face of a, a man, a lion, a, an ox, a calf, or an eagle? What, what, have you, what are you thinking there? What do you think that might represent? You've probably no doubt heard other prophetic teachers teach what that may represent. Um, but again, I think, I think it's reasonably universal that since the earliest of days, if we go back, and feel free to jump in with a comment there if somebody knows what those represent. Um, but since the early, we actually have commentary on this from the year 202. That's pretty old, isn't it? It's pretty old commentary. The year 202, uh, St. Irenaeus, who was Bishop of, of Lyon, uh, one of the great writers in his writings against heresies. He's writing to champion the truth of God, and he teaches about these four creatures. And he actually says that he believes that these four represent... Can you guess? What else is fourfold in the story of God? I bet you can guess. What else is fourfold in the story of God? We've touched on the 12 of the Old Testament. We've touched on the 12 of the New Testament. But what is fourfold? You know the answer. Somebody jump in with the answer. I know you know. What is fourfold? This is where I need my Jeopardy music. I know there's a little lag from when I ask and when you guys get the answer. But type it in there if you know. What is fourfold? Valerie, thanks. I'm glad you're with us tonight, Valerie. Um, praying for Charlie. I'll have to get an update from you a little bit later on that. Gospels, that's correct. The four Gospels. As early as Irenaeus in the year 202, this, these four creatures have been uh, compared to the Gospels. The fact that they're looking, there, there's four points to the compass, okay? 
uh, four directions to, to go. There are, uh, God is everywhere. They're seeing everything. The Gospels being fourfold represent the fullness of the Word is for everywhere, in all places, in all lands, at all times. And we have four distinct tellings of the gospel. So they're four distinct creatures, if you will. Um, now, Irenaeus had the idea that he saw, he saw Mark, uh, he's, no, actually he saw John as the lion. He saw the calf or the ox as Luke. He saw uh, the man, the face of the human, as Matthew. And he saw the eagle um, as Mark, I believe. Yeah. So that's just John, that's that's just the way he saw it. You know, you look at it is when you look at some of those, you think, well, in Matthew, the generation of man in the, the genealogies that are given are very uh, obvious, and so he saw that together. Luke, the ox or the calf, the ox and the calf are both sacramental animals. They represent the sacrificial nature. And Luke, uh, of the four Gospels, does give a priestly type view of Jesus. Uh, the lion, uh, John, again, this is regal, this is royal. Um, and John is the one that tells us about Jesus being God. Um, Matthew, of course, with that man, also Jesus becomes man in the, the telling of the story. And then, of course, Mark uh, as an eagle. Uh, you know, Mark was the first gospel written. The One of the most beautiful things in the gospel is when the dove is hovering over Jesus at his baptism. And so he sees the eye of the eagle as hovering over, if you will. Now, this is, this is just speculation. That's speculation on Irenaeus' part. The scriptures don't teach us that. But I think they do, just like the 12 and the 12 and the 24 show us, that this is a, this is a symbol to the people that heard it in the day of John's revelation and for us standing today, that what is right before the throne of God is the, is the, the gospel, the truth of God, the story of God. The story of us, the story of his, the story of his saving of creation, the story of it being filling the world and for all peoples who will receive him. That is clear, I think, in why this story is using four creatures here. Um, so as we go just a little bit deeper, now several of the great Christian writers and saints have varied those. It seems like Luke and Matthew are always the ox and the man, but the Mark and John ones, the lion and the, uh, and the eagle have flipped by different thinkers in, uh, in Christianity. Some of you have maybe even seen windows. Now, the next time you see a stained glass window, especially if you're in, a, uh, in an Anglican church or an Episcopal type church, you will see uh, there was some beautiful stained glass art from the Middle Ages that was very uh, and, and later, that was very uh, descriptive of these. And you'll see those, uh, the, the statue of the evangelist or the picture of the evangelist in the stained glass art with these symbols, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. So you may have never wondered, you may have always wondered why that was and never known. Now you know. Uh, so <clears throat> I think that here's another thing that Scott McKnight tell, points out very well in this book is, as you see next week, as we read chapter 5, you will notice that these four creatures actually play a part in what's about to happen in chapter 6 through chapter 17. Chapter 6 through 17 is the, it's the great tribulation, if you will, that we've all read about and heard about. It's describing this, this life of the disciple in Babylon, where they have to live as a dissident disciple, and horrible atrocities happen. They represent, of course, the judgment of God these atrocities do. But there is this 
sense in which these four creatures will play this part. As you're going to learn in chapter 5, only the Lamb of God, again another creature, uh, we'll learn next week, is, is, uh, is the one who can commence these judgments, if you will. But definitely the four creatures as the four Gospels are there because they are the truth. They are the ones that predicted. Jesus, in his own words, prophesied judgment upon the face of the earth. Um, it was to come. And so it's pretty fitting that the gospel little creatures there are uh, servants of the Most High God in heaven, in the throne room, and helping open up these scrolls and, and things like that. Um, or announce them, not opening them. So, as you look at the balance of, of this chapter, I, I, want you to, I want to draw you back in to the stage that is being set. The stage that is being, John is, <clears throat> he's introduced the revelation, he's given the specific letters to the churches, which we now know are representative of the church in every age. There were real churches, those were real problems in those churches, real sins, and those were real prophecies to those churches. But as much as the church today, or the church in any age, uh, falls into sin, those same prophecies apply to us today and have throughout the generations until Christ returns. So, in that context, I want you to hear that we're about to jump into we're about to jump into chapter 5 and it is amazing what happens in chapter 5. And I, I just want to bring you I want I want to bring you a little bit uh, into chapter 5 for just a minute because I want you to read through it. If you haven't been reading chapter 4 and 5 this week. I want you to read it again this week, and but prepare for next Wednesday. And I want you to think about what is worship. How do we define what is worship? Different denominations, different types of churches worship differently. And we have everything from uh, ultra-contemporary rock music worship to uh, ancient chanting. Uh, we have very uh, liturgical styles of worship with incense and candles and bells and, and you know, uh, ancient music. And we have everything in between. We have church organs. We have hymns that have lasted for hundreds of years now. We have modern music. All of these represent a facet of worship, but not any of them is precisely worship. And I'm going to tell you why I think that's again. Now, I'm giving you my opinion here. I always tell you I'll give you when it's my opinion. It's because what I've learned is what, what I've learned is that worship is ultimately a matter of the human heart, not what we do. Valerie said, Quakers with silent waiting worship. Good example. Another, another great example throughout the, the history where the Quakers would sit in silence and wait for the Holy Spirit to move, to speak. Again, another beautiful form of worship. But worship is ultimately, this is something that I began, uh, this began to bother me in my, in my young Christian days. You know, we call going to church, you know, we're worshiping. When we go to church, we're worshiping. Um, and I, I was rather troubled with the thought of the historical church and why, why do those people worship this way and these people worship this way? And, and some people say theirs is right and theirs is wrong. And people say, well, I don't like that kind of worship, but I do like my kind. And, and it's just, it's an adventure in missing the point. Yes, we're all different. Yes, we all have different uh, likes and, and dislikes. But when it comes to worship, it should be intensely a matter of, of the human heart. And if God is, if Almighty God, as these creatures do, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, 
Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, as we pray in the, some of the, uh, the communion liturgies. Words, again, of angels. Um, if all of that is, if God Almighty is the object of our worship, it shouldn't matter what the music sounds like. It shouldn't matter if there's candles in the church or not. It shouldn't matter if uh, you're standing or sitting. All of these things have been given to us throughout time as aids to worship. Okay, and let's be clear about this. God himself gave humanity aids for worship. Liturgical aids. God, it was God that said put candlesticks in the tabernacle and in the temple. It is God who said burn incense before my altar. All of this was given by God. And there were very special reasons. There were very special. Because, and as we saw here, there were seven candlesticks, is the word used here, before the throne of God. And they represent, it says here, the Spirit of God. Seven meaning the complete number. Seven days throughout the creation story and the final day of rest, the six plus one. So there's a fullness to that. The fullness of the Spirit is everywhere. Um, I see a note here. Kim said, if worship is a matter of the heart, then worship is also a time of communication with God. Amen. Amen. In fact, maybe no, no greater time of communication than in the midst of worship. And... You can also say, you made me think of this, Kim, you can also say it's a matter of prayer. It's a, Worshiping God is a form of prayer as well. So commun it's communion with the Almighty. And when that comes from our heart, when it's born of our heart, it won't matter what the style is. Now, does that mean that we have to belong to a church that plays rock music and we don't want it to? No, because we've been given the gift of having a variety. Go where you feel led. Go where you feel the Spirit of God speaking to you. Because it's not wrong to have preferences. What's wrong is to say, mine's right, yours is wrong. That's what's wrong. They're all, and I had to learn this the hard way. Because gr growing up, I, I kept searching for what was the, what's the correct form of worship. I, you know, I, those of you that know me well know that I spent a lot of time in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. And, and it was there that I was taught, this is correct worship. And they would tell me what your Protestant or, you know, evangelical churches were doing is it really worship. And, you know, that I bought into that for a while. I don't buy that anymore because I've experienced both and I know the difference. Both can be worship, okay, because it's born of the heart. Worship is always a matter of the heart, just like idolatry. Idolatry, which is the worship of other gods, is always a matter of the heart. So, what can we say about this incredible God who's called us to worship him in the beauty, in the splendor, in the majesty of heavenly worship. Kim said, so it's safe to say worship is a personal matter, not necessarily a ritual, just to say I worshiped, correct? Yes, correct. You may have gone to church and not have worshiped. You may have gone to do the rituals, but not have worshiped, because your heart wasn't in it. And that's true of anyone, I don't mean you. And I am not saying these types of worship is wrong. I'm thinking more of a personal experience. I get that. I, I, I understand what you mean. But you're, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. We can go to church every Sunday. We can go begrudgingly. We can go three times on Sunday. We can do whatever we want and not have worshipped. One of, one of my favorite writers uh, with a Wichita connection, Richard Foster, used to teach at Friends University, wrote the classic book, The Celebration of Discipline, which is one of those books every Christian should read. If they haven't, get it, read it. came out, I think, in 1972 when he was at Friends. It's still in print many times over. Powerful book. 
But he says in there on one of the disciplines, he lists, he lists worship as a corporate discipline, uh, a spiritual discipline. And what one of the things he says in there is, uh, I love how he says, worship happens when spirit touches spirit. God's spirit touches our spirit. Worship happens. Think about that for a little while. That's a powerful, powerful thought. So I'm giving you all of this tonight. I'm concentrating on these meanings of these 12, the 24, the sevenness, the seven fullness of the Spirit of God. And because everyone has been invited to worship the God of creation. Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai. Everyone has been invited to worship God. And what we are doing, we are inviting, when we share the gospel, when we share things like this Bible study, we're inviting people to experience an otherworldly touch. I really, truly believe that the heart of worship is an otherworldly touch upon our humanity. Valerie said, worship happens when spirit touches spirit. Is that what you said by a foster? That is exactly what I said. I was paraphrasing foster uh, in his chapter on worship. When his spirit touches our spirit, capital S and small s, you got it. Um, I can't tell you enough. A, a number of years ago now, maybe a decade ago or so, maybe 15 years, I don't keep track of it, there was, uh, it is a powerful image. You're right, Valerie. Um, and it can, what's even more powerful is it can happen everywhere. I have been in the middle of literal Christian concerts and worshiped because I was so drawn to the touch of God's Spirit. I've also been on my knees in cathedrals, in foreign countries, in the Holy Land and smelled the incense, and in the dark room saw the beautiful light of the candles, and I have worshipped, listening to the chant of some monks off in the other room or something. I mean, it, it, it's all beautiful. It's all part of God's kingdom, and it's all beautiful, and there's a place for everything. Isn't that, that's the whole point of the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is a point to everything, and there's a place for everything, and there's a time for everything. So I'm just so excited to share with you tonight this lesson, this chapter 4 and chapter 5, because it's really going to speak to us, I believe, about worship. So let's talk about worship as we transition to prayer tonight. This Sunday, when, when you go to church, I'm, I'm praying that everyone in this Bible study will go to church somewhere. If you don't have anywhere to go, come out and join me. I would love for that, Mountain Goddard, the Goddard Church. Um, and if you can't get there, tune us in online. Worship starts at 10 o'clock. But wherever you are, please, I know I'm speaking to people around the world, go to church. And I want you to go this week with fresh eyes. I don't know what your style will be or where you're going. But whatever it is, I want you to go not thinking about the style of worship or the style of music or, the, or, or, or anything about I want you to go thinking about being in the gathered, holy assembly of people, of God's people, and listening for the voice of the Spirit of God, for His touch upon your spirit. There was a song 10, 15 years ago, I don't know exactly when, it was written by a, a man named Matt Redman. Matt Redman, and the, the song says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. That says it all right there. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. He says in there, it's a confession. He says, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. <laughs> That is a confession we all need to pray right there. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, because it's all about you, Jesus. 
and you speak to people differently in different languages, in different ways, in different styles, through different music. God, our Lord, God, Jesus Christ, he cannot be put in a box. So, how beautiful is worship? Wow. I'm, I'm praying that you see it brighter in, in, in a more uh, sacred way this, this Sunday, wherever you're at. As we move to a time of prayer, you know, if you're new to Bible study live, we always spend deep time in the Word, and then we go into prayer at the closing. And I invite your prayer requests. Um, I take notes upon what they are, and you can share them right here in these comments. Um, and Valerie said, if you haven't read the story behind Rat Matt Redman's song, Do. And you know, Valerie, I, I think I read it a long time ago, and I have it recently. I need to go back and reread it, because I've got a feeling it's pretty powerful. Um, it was actually told to me once at a conference I was at when the, the singer introduced it, but now I've forgotten a lot of the details. Um, I've been asking for the last couple of weeks for prayer for my best friend, Greg Hefner. And, uh, and I'm still asking for prayer for him. But he got the worst news anyone could get. And uh, his thank you for linking it, Valerie. Thank you so much. Uh, Greg's tumor was the worst kind in the worst place. No treatment, no cure. He's being sent home today or tomorrow with hospice care. 59 years old. It's had a huge impact on my life. Not just as a best friend, but as a, as a Christian, as a servant of the Lord, as a husband and a father, a businessman. He has been always there for me. I love him dearly. Oh, how I pray that God would just miraculously touch his body and heal that cancer. But, you know, that may not be in God's plan because God knows things we don't know. But I'm not going to stop believing. I'm not going to stop praying because as long as I have breath, there's always hope. Uh, as long as we have breath. So that's heavy on my heart tonight to pray for Greg, his family. The Lord would be ever close surrounding them. Uh, what's on your heart? What can I pray for you about? And if you have anything that's intensely personal and you don't want to share it here, you can say it's unspoken. Or you can go to bradrileyministries.org and click on the prayer portal. I'm the only one that ever sees that. We'll pray together. Rhonda said, Amen. We love Greg and Peggy and their family. Yes, we do. Deeply. Deeply. Words can't describe how much we love them. What else is on your heart? Anyone? Anything specific? I know there's unspoken needs. There always are. And we speak that word unspoken, but God knows. But there's something about the community of us agreeing together in, in, in prayer, in the spirit. That Jesus said, where two or three are gathered. So that's what we're doing right now. We're gathered. Uh, a young boy, Susan said, named Abram, 12. Abram, 12 years old, diagnosed with leukemia. Oh, dear. I'm going to write that down. Abram. Let us pray for Abram. Only 12. So much pain in, in the world. Um, Kim is fighting an infection, and, and uh, we're going to pray against that infection. Kim, infection. Abram, leukemia. Anybody else? Anything specific? You know... One day we will all be right here. We've been given a gift to see into the throne room of God. One day it will be you and I falling down before the eternal God of glory and worshiping him uh, in, in ways that transcend our words. Um, 
so much more that could be said. So much more. But I want to pray with you. I can't wait to talk about chapter 5 next week. It's going to blow your mind. Some things in chapter 5 are going to blow your mind. So do not miss next week. We, we're going to continue this thought of worship. And, and as I close chapter 5, then I'll, I'll relate why these creatures and this interlude, this chapter 4 and 5 are so important in this book. Uh, but that's for next week. Thank you all for joining me. What a powerful group tonight. I'm just so thrilled to have you here. And I know there's many who are not and didn't say hello. And that's okay. I just, I'd love to know you're out there. So I'd love for people to say hello. I love the dialogue and the discussion. But, uh, and you know, you can always keep the dialogue going. It, just put a thought or a note or a prayer request or anything there, even afterwards. We all get notified if you've been one that's been on the, the thread, because that's what Facebook does. That's kind of a cool thing. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for supporting my ministry. Thank you for sharing this word with others. Let's, I mean, this is, talk about a non-threatening way to share the gospel. Just give them, give people this. We're going to hear the truth in love. I'm not going to condemn anyone. I'm not going to judge anyone. I'm not the judge, but I am going to give them the truth in love. Thank you, Ruth Feather. Good to know you're there. Would you pray with me as we close tonight? Pray for remembering Greg and Peggy and their family and the Abram, this little boy, and Kim and all the other many requests. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we just want to fall down tonight. We, we just want to say with these creatures and these elders, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. We just want to worship you. May our prayers be ascending to your throne room even now. Oh, that they would re be received by you in a way that would move your hand to touch and to heal and to bless healing of Greg, miraculous, mighty healing of Greg, healing of the pain in his family, healing of the infection that is in, in this little boy's leukemia, healing uh, of the infection that's in Kim, healing of all of the many things that plague us. Not for our glory, but for yours. That we may give you glory and show this world your beauty and your power and your might. And I know that you don't need us to do that, but you've called us to pray. You've called us to worship. You've called us to ask for healing. You've called us to do all these things, and so we do. I thank you for the book of Revelation. I thank you for opening our eyes, giving us a glimpse of heaven tonight, of worship in heaven. Draw us back next week for an even fuller vision of it. And Father God, be with us in that all that we do and say, we would give you glory and praise and honor. For you alone are worthy. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. And it's in your strong name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you for praying. Thank you for joining me in Bible study. Man, I look forward to this every Wednesday night. So, uh, you know, I'm so glad you're out there. I want to thank you. Th and thank you to those that jump into the conversation, okay? We're all growing from the conversation that, that, that you're feeding us here. So God bless you. I love you all. Can't wait to see you. I hope to see some of you on Sunday. Bye now.